first of all, a very warm welcome to all of our guests, and good morning. What a beautiful day for Green Gains Live, too. Thank you for coming. Um, this is the second Green Gains Festival, and I'd like to welcome all of the government agencies and leaders from local, regional, and national level government agencies. So many of our customers are here, private landowners, the charities like the Wildlife Trust, Wildflower Trust, Bumblebee Trust, organizations, Kew Gardens, Cambridge University, and so importantly, our colleagues from Ground Control. There are a huge team of like-minded individuals that work at Ground Control that care deeply about the environment, about biodiversity, and about nature. And we have wonderful biologists, ecologists, biodiversity specialists, and environmental sustainability specialists here to lead you on tours later on. So very warm welcome. Thank you so much for coming. And we are streaming live on LinkedIn and YouTube. So for our virtual audience, thank you so much for tuning in this morning. And we'll be taking questions from you throughout the first part of the morning. And then we'll have Q&A for those lab participants and those online at the very end of today's sessions before the tours commence. So what are we going to talk about most importantly today is how do we collectively, we're all here because we care about biodiversity, what can we do, learn, and talk about to really advance networks for nature conservation? More than ever, it's up to businesses and charities. Coming out of um, the European Union with that long-term vision on sustainability and legislation that protected nature without short-term political objectives, and now changes we see it every day in priorities around COVID, our wars, our economic collapse, whatever it is, how can businesses and charities keep things going for a longer term view for nature and ecology? And so that is the, the challenge that we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to talk about Wildfell. My colleague, Chris <coughs> Bothry, will talk about the progress we've been made now in design, but especially coupling and partnering with the Forestry Commission, with Woodland Trust, with the Wildlife Trust, to really think about what we can do there on a 300 acre canvas. And that Wildfell Center is really to help our customers think about what they can do. We've made the investment commercially and how can we all learn from that? And uh, we're gonna run through first and foremost our wonderful keynote speaker, Tony Juniper. Um, he's our keynote speaker. For those of you that are not familiar with Tony, he's the chair of Natural England. He has been an executive director of almost all the big wildlife organizations uh, for the past 35 years. So World Wildlife Fund, Friends of the Earth. He advises private businesses. He was a fellow at Cambridge University. He's an advisor to the Prince of Wales. He's written so many different books and um, was described as the, the country's leading eco-warrior. Um, I always call people a force of nature, but Tony is a force for nature. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tony to the stage, and we're going to have about 40 minutes with him. Well, th thank you very much indeed, Kim, for that very nice introduction and, and warm welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be continuing uh, to see the journey that Ground Control has been on, and I've been delighted to be a very small part of the thinking that you've been developing over these years. And I think to say that your company now is in a leadership position really understates uh, where you've got to because it's really incredible the work that you've been doing including bringing people together to start thinking about what might be done about some of these questions because as time goes on you know the kind of jeopardy just goes up and up and up as we witness massive forest fires extreme temperature events water shortages endless reports coming from UN agencies about how pressing the situation is and and, and yet we still struggle to move into the zone of, of decisive action, but that's really where we must be. There is no time really now for, for talk anymore. It's about doing, and uh, that's what today is all about. When it comes to these sustainability discussions over recent years, and I think if you, if you just kind of tune into the media, look at the political discussion, see where the speeches have been going from different leaders, it's climate, 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 carbon, carbon, carbon. And of course, this is completely correct. It, there is an emergency underway and we all know about that and COP26 in this country last year was an opportunity to really focus on the implications and what's happening and what needs to be done. But there's been another dimension to this sustainability story which has been sl flying slightly below the radar 
is starting to get up now as a result of COP15 this year, the Biodiversity Conference will hopefully see a little bit more of this. But the truth is, is that there's a parallel crisis seen in the decline of biodiversity, which is right there with climate change and which needs equal urgent attention, if not more urgent attention. And part of the trouble with the biodiversity piece is it's a little bit more complicated. And so carbon coming out of your exhaust pipe or by switching the light on, it's relatively easy. We're going to shut a coal-fired power station and we're going to have renewables. You can see the connections and it's easy to explain. With biodiversity, it's not so easy to explain. And part of the trouble actually comes with that word, I've, I've decided, uh, over the years. Um, would you believe the BBC, um, I think in about 2011, did, did a vox pop. They went into the street and they asked members of the public, what do you think biodiversity is? And do you know what the single most popular answer was? A washing powder. <laughs> now, that's an anecdote based upon a survey of the public, but I think it's probably not wrong in the sense of how much we need to improve the communications and understanding on all of this. And this is one reason why during my work over recent years, I've kind of abolished the word biodiversity and replaced it with nature. I think more people get nature. Um, uh, it's actually quite a profound term and it's got really kind of very wide kind of interpretation, which is good. It's the name of the world's most prestigious scientific journal. And it's also the study that you do in primary school with your nature table. And it's got everything in between. And I think it's the right way of looking at this because it is about literally everything. That's what we're talking about. The fabric of our society, our economy, our civilization, it all depends upon nature. And the trouble is, is that it's in massive decline. Uh, and the reason it's in massive decline is because of increasing human demand. The human demand is going up and the biodiversity is going down. You all will have seen pictures of tropical rainforests being cut down. You will have seen pictures of coral reefs going into terminal decline as a result of ocean heating and acidification. And you will have seen uh, the ever lengthening lists of, of species that are disappearing from so-called red lists compiled by the scientists. And all of this is, is a manifestation of biodiversity loss and crucially ecosystem degradation. These two things are going alongside each other. And uh, the um, loss of abundance is one measure. So out in the countryside here, 50 years ago, you would have seen many more birds and butterflies uh, in terms of numbers. Some of the species have actually gone as well, but you would have seen a decline in abundance. Across the globe, we're also seeing a decline in species as represented by extinction. You know, that, that's the end. Uh, once something has gone over the edge of that particular uh, uh, point, then it's into oblivion, it's gone for good. And the extinction rate on our planet at the moment is ramping up very rapidly. You can see the curve going like this. Um, it's difficult to measure, unlike tons of carbon, because we haven't even documented the wildlife that shares this planet with us. Probably nine or so million other species. Uh, we've described about two million. We're assuming there's seven million more there based upon what we think we don't know. That's how precise this science is. But based upon what we do know and the ones we're monitoring, and in this country we've got better data than anywhere, we can see it going down. Why should we save biodiversity? Why should we restore nature? Why should we be investing in this? Cost of living crisis, uh, we've got economic growth, we've got to get back on track. Surely these environmental priorities, they're getting in the way of economic growth, aren't they? And therefore we must prioritise progress for the people above the protection or recovery of nature. That's how the political narrative goes. And unfortunately, there is still life in that. I thought a few years ago that the final breath of the idea that we have to sacrifice nature to achieve progress, I thought it was about to die off, but it's still there. It's weaker than it was. But the thought that we have to sacrifice the fabric of this planet's living systems in order to sustain human well-being, people still think it. But actually, the science tells us the complete opposite is correct. If we wish to have a functioning society, economy, and indeed civilization at the end of this century, or possibly even closer than that, then we have to halt and reverse the destruction of nature as a matter of urgent priority. You look out there at all that green stuff, all that green stuff has got a very important thing in it. It's called carbon. This planet has carbon-based life forms, and the more we have carbon-based life forms thriving and accumulating carbon from the atmosphere, the less of it is in the air warming up the planet. It's a very simple equation. So the more we can protect and restore woodlands and forests and grasslands, 
the less we will have to do through energy efficiency, renewables and nuclear and everything else. The interactions between different organisms not only help to suppress disease, also to suppress pests. We've become very used in our agriculture over many decades now to be uh, seeing solutions out of bottles of chemicals, um, when in fact ecological solutions would help to cut emissions, restore nature and actually improve food security. Many examples from the scientific literature telling us of the value of ladybirds, of lace wings, of barn owls, of songbirds in suppressing different kinds of pests. We need to relearn what our ancestors knew, that actually quite a lot of the answers to food security, they're not in a bottle, they're in a better understanding of how the natural world works. One of the examples I looked at was um, the case in southwestern China, uh, where during the 1980s they had very heavy pesticide use to try and control various insect pests, and uh, they killed all the bumblebees. And so now, nearly 40 years later, if you go there in the springtime, you'll find the farmers, the fruit farmers, climbing in the trees with a long stick with a feather duster on the end, moving the pollen between the blossoms by hand, because the bumblebees have gone. That's when you can start to see the economic cost of removing some of these bits of the ecosystem. Uh, 20 fruit farmers needed to replace the work of one bumblebee nest. We've been hearing a lot about food and energy security lately, haven't we? Um, as if environmental security has got nothing to do with it. I'm afraid it's got absolutely everything to do with it. And the more we degrade the system that's sustaining us, the more we jeopardise the future of our social fabric. It's that simple. I mean, this stuff has been seen as like an environmental issue for all of my career. It's not. It's an economic issue of the most fundamental importance, and we need to start acting as if that were the case, because we have the science. And increasingly, we have the, the kind of collective social experience, don't we? That pandemic, which we've just been through, you know, we, we now know at a kind of much more intuitive level, collectively, the value of nature to society. We've got a lot of data on this. We collect vast amounts of it at Natural England, looking at people's experience in the natural world and the extent to which we get psychological and physical well-being benefits. I saw a number yesterday, uh, which um, has been produced by some academics. Every pound invested in access to the natural environment, you get seven pounds value back for the National Health Service. So blending nature back into the fabric of where we go every day. And this is why this is such an important agenda for everyone in this room. Housing, retail, infrastructure. These are the places where we have to put nature. It's not only about saving the Amazon, it is about that. But we've got to bring back nature to where people are because people do much better when they have nature in their lives. And this is something that can be done at the same time as catching carbon, as cleaning up the water, as reducing flood risk, as well as uh, bringing back missing and disappearing species. All of these things need to be seen as part of the same agenda. And this is why at Natural England, we, we've now embarked on uh, a new phase of our work. For, for many years, we were um, an organisation committed to conservation, which is about hanging on to the remnants of, of what's left, a rare species of beetle living here, uh, a small population of rare birds over there, uh, a piece of ancient woodland somewhere else. We're going to draw lines on maps. We're going to regulate. We're going to try and hang on to that. And we continue to do that. This is a vital part of our work, make no mistake. But now what we're talking about is nature recovery, because the simple fact is, if we want to do all these things that we know we need to do for our health, our wealth and our security in terms of food and the uh, uh, sustenance of infrastructure at a time of climate change and in terms of public health and water, we need more nature, not less. It's no longer enough to say what we've got just needs to be protected. We've got to push it back up, recreate the abundance, recreate the vibrancy of ecosystems. And it's possible that we're just in time to do that, even in a country like Britain. A lot of what we once had still hangs on. It's now in smaller populations, isolated pockets. And this is why we're now talking about a nature recovery network being at the centre of what we need to do and to facilitate working with partners across multiple sectors, uh, especially private businesses, uh, but also the conservation organisations, other government departments and agencies, to be able to create uh, uh, a transformation in the health of nature in this country, which is now one of the most depleted in the world. And the Nature Recovery Network is about having more spaces rich in nature, about having bigger ones and having them in better state, looked after for the biodiversity, and then having connected together with one another. And this is the very exciting piece, is the extent to which, by working together, we can do all of that.
especially that connectivity piece. Because the truth is, there is not one single institution in this country, not even the mighty British government, that can wave a wand and say we will have nature recovery. It doesn't work like that. This country is owned and managed by tens of thousands of different entities, uh, some of them private, some of them public, some of them charities, all with different objectives. But what we have to find a way of doing is bringing the same objective across all of those different actors to recover nature. And for all of those people managing land, if we come together, we can do this. Uh, and it's something that at Natural England we're already beginning to see the embryo of that idea growing very rapidly. More and more people coming in. Uh, the Nature Recovery Network Delivery Partnership that we set up uh, recently, Ground Control is a member of that. Uh, we now have 650 organisations in there. We had a fantastic meeting yesterday up in Middlesbrough. And one of the striking things there, including coming from the local government, was the extent to which the penny does seem to have finally dropped in different places. This is not an environmental issue, at least not only. This is about economic renewal, it's about social regeneration, and ultimately it's about the salvation of civilization. It's really that big, and people are beginning to understand that. So my message here is, please do understand that this is your business, not just natural England, uh, and it is literally business. This is about managing risk, it's about securing opportunities, and it's about being a little bit more thoughtful and creative about how we think about these subjects. Fortunately, what you have is a fantastic partner in the form of ground control, who have the people and the expertise, and most importantly, the passion and the mission to do this with you. But you're gonna to have to open your eyes a little bit and just try and put some of the things that maybe shape your thinking now to one side. You know, are you worried that the customers might think things look a bit untidy? Well, they might do, but explain to them this is a planetary emergency, or at least explain to them there's some beautiful butterflies to look at when they come out of the shop. These are the kinds of things we now need to start to navigate, but it's gonna require us to put old thinking behind us and start to adopt some new thinking fit for the 21st century that we're now in, which is a time of crisis. And one of those crises is an ecological one, but fortunately um, it's possible to fix it. Thank you very much indeed. I'll stop there and uh, we'll take any questions won't we, later. <laughs>
Dow from Severn Trent Water is leading everything on the environmental initiatives around the Commonwealth Games, and he's going to talk more about that, and Chris Bautry. The theme of this project is what does landscape managed for nature mean within your organizations? We're going to start with the pre-recorded insight from Liv at Severn Trent Water. I'm Liv Garfield, Chief Executive of Seven Trent, and I'm so sorry I can't be there today because I know what wonderful work Ground Control does in this exact arena. Now, biodiversity is right at the heart of our strategy. We genuinely believe that for any business to get to net zero, then the other side of the coin is biodiversity, it's nature. So we say consistently as an organisation, what's good for nature is good for water. Now, I thought I'd share a couple of things that we're doing, not um, on any level other than just, I sometimes think other people's ideas help spark that magic idea for yourself. So the journey that we've been on and the ideas that we've come out with are as follows. So the first thing is that we're a proud regional employer. There's not many companies actually headquartered in the Midlands and to have the Commonwealth Games this year meant that we felt that we had to kind of step into that space and make sure that we hosted the games as an area, but actually we left a legacy thereafter. And that's why we committed to work with the Commonwealth Games Partnership to create an ongoing legacy of 2,022 acres of trees. Now see what we've done there, 2022, and we're well on track with doing that. Now of course that will create an amazing carbon sequester situation for the future, as well as a wonderful immunity for the public. So that's one of the first things we've done, is to think of nature as a legacy act. The second thing, of course, is to think about it with your net zero plans. And that's why we've committed to really making biodiverse, re remaking biodiverse, I should say in some sense, 5,000 hectares of land. And we've actually delivered that five years ahead of target and we completed in the next few months and we gave ourselves to 2027 to do that. Now that's an area the size of Gloucester and it's 1% of the national efforts that Natural England is trying to lead on. But we know actually there's an even more special activity you can do in biodiversity and that's around peatland restoration. And because we know that that has multiple times the benefits of anything else in the space, we also committed to 2,000 acres of peatland restoration. Now we know actually that nature has brilliant health benefits. We all know during the course of lockdowns that we walked our dogs more than ever before. In my case, I got a dog just to walk the dog, right? And we know that people really connect with nature. And so in inner city urban areas, we also want to create little hotspots, little kind of enclaves where you can see nature at work. And that's why we've also created 72 tiny forests, which are right in the hearts of city centres, giving that passion to people living a more urban lifestyle. I hope that's brought to you three things to life. One is that there are a series of big bulk moments. We believe that's the only answer in the biodiversity arena, is to go big and bold. The second thing is, it's hugely empowering and engaging for your organisation. Seven Trent adores this activity in these moments. And the third thing is that actually, you can do things that make a real difference for your business commercially. So our net zero ambition, we believe to be an ongoing long-term commercial plan, and biodiversity is part of that. So it's not just out of the goodness of our hearts, we do it with that commercial lens as well. Thank you for listening, and I hope today goes great. Thank you to Liv. Liv is celebrating her 20th wedding anniversary today and selfishly chose that instead of being here with us. But we are delighted to have Ricky. Ricky, will you take about two minutes and just walk through the initiatives that you're managing? Liv touched on many of them and talk about what landscapes managed for nature means to you at Seven Trent Water. Yeah, of course. So first of all, I'm Ricky Dallow, uh, Forest Creation Lead for Seven Trent. Uh, and I work within the environment team, um, which for, for those who are based not in, in the Midlands, Seven Trent op occupy from the Welsh border across to Leicester, from Gloucester, all the way up to the Humber. So a good chunk of the Midlands and a bit here, there and everywhere. Um, and two years ago, um, we made the pledge to work with the, the Commonwealth Games as a nature and carbon neutral legacy sponsor for that Games. Ultimately, the, the trees weren't in the ground by the time of the Games, so it's all about leaving a carbon neutral legacy going forward. So over the next 35 years, the 2022 acres we will be planting will sequester all the carbon emitted from the Games, which is happening in T minus two weeks, three weeks. Thank you so much, Ricky. Um, next, I'd like to have Matt Palmer talk about the greenest road ever to be built. Uh, yes, yeah, so, <laughs> hi, I'm, I'm Matt Palmer. I'm the Exec Director for National Highways Looking After Lower Thames Crossing. Um, I must admit, it could be a very hostile gig, this, you know, a road builder. <laughs> um, and so, you know, just, just a little bit on Lower Thames Crossing. As Kim says, it, it's to alleviate Dartford. It's the largest road project since the M25. Um, historically, we haven't done roads very well in this country. We could all list off sort of Twyford Down and a number of other uh, great projects that have completely looked at one side of the dimension, the economic side. Um, 
So my challenge, my challenge is to try and pragmatically take what is an economic project and, and take Tony's words really. Be, how do you be creative and do the broader thing? I'm so glad Tony you said by, we can talk about nature rather than biodiversity because A, I struggle to spell it and B, I've always <laughs> wondered quite what it is. So, so how do I balance nature and deliver a 23 kilometre road, eight billion pounds worth of investment? Um, and you know, it's a journey. These are, these are long um, established projects that take a long time to, to, to deliver. You know, we've, been, we've been around designing this for 10 years at least. We've got another 10 years before it comes to fruition in terms of open. Um, and so what we've done through that time is work with partners really to try and understand what we need to do. And I think, you know, I do think the world is changing. I think 10 years ago, this certainly the project I'm on and projects other people are on would have been talked about cost and time and nature might have been there as a sort of footnote. It probably wouldn't even be a footnote. I think we're now at a, tip, a slight tipping point. I think people are talking about it. And what that's allowed me to do is actually say, right, there's a much rounder, richer conversation, and there is no longer economic gain and cost. There's economic gain and cost, there's uh, carbon and there's nature, and, it, and we've got to, we're talking about that much more generally. Um, so not talking about carbon, but I suppose then talking about what we're trying to do on the Thames Crossing. Um, and we, we recognise that A, road builders don't have a good reputation, so we're trying to do the, do prove that we're different. So the first thing we've done, we haven't even got planning permission for the road. We've gone out and bought uh, a farm, um, which is an interesting story in itself, down at Brentwood. So 10 miles away, we've got 100 hectares um, of land, which we're going to start planting up this year. And, the, uh, and we'll carry on through planning permission for the road, but we'll get that into, into service. We're a public open space, and we're working with forestry um, England to sort of out, out to consultation really to understand what the community wants, etc. So that's the first piece. Then overall, we'll bring on about a thousand acres of compensatory or mitigatory planting, um, also land. About half of it's public access, so trying to deal with this: how do we get greater connectivity? So how do we do that sympathetically? Um, and I have to say, you know, that on that journey, and certainly the, the journey I've only been on on the project for two years, and in that two years, I've seen the real benefit of sort of working with partners, in, in particular Natural England, actually, if I'm honest, they've pushed and encouraged us down journey, you know, avenues that we wouldn't have gone before. The road is quite extraordinary. You should take a look, not only on the scale of, of the, you know, infrastructure, but that there's bridges for nature going across the Lower Thames Crossing. It's going under the Thames. Everything they're doing to try and mitigate negative impact on nature, but also put things in place for positive impact on nature. And it's extraordinary. And I hope it all happens as the plans currently look. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Chris and Philip and I, when we launched the Evergreen Fund and we were looking for landowners because we made a commitment as part of this 5% of our profits going into um, green uh, carbon reducing technology investments along with 100,000 pounds a year for tree planting, we thought all of our commercial customers would just like, you know, open the doors and say, yes, plan here. And it was super tough. So then we had to look a bit further afield and we met, um, we met Make It Wild, Chris and Helen Neve up in the, in the Yorkshire Dales. And we helped them with a the super hedge. But Helen can't be here today. She's supposed to be on the panel. But she's sent a video message to talk about that project. But it's an example of a private landowner who has a commitment to do things to support nature. And they've just had wonderful inroads. So over to Helen now via video link. I think that supporting biodiversity is one of the most important things that we can do as business people, as entrepreneurs, as custodians of the land. We are in a climate and ecological emergency. We're in the sixth mass extinction. And if we don't look after biodiversity, there is no future for us. Some of the things we're doing at Make It Wild to support biodiversity are uh, protecting our ancient woodland, planting thousands of new trees, digging ponds, putting up bird boxes. We have a rewilding um, section, about 60 acres under rewilding where we have Belted Galloways and Exmoor Ponies, and they have supported the return of all kinds of wildflowers, which in turn supports insects, which are fundamental to our ecosystem. Um, and really, Make It Wild was set up for this very thing. It was set up to bring nature back. So it, it's absolutely fundamental to everything that we do. Um, Helen and Chris have been living this dream for 15 years. They were a very successful entrepreneur 
in Chris's case and in Helen's case, a doctor. And with their kids, they started planting trees. They involved the communities all around where they lived. And now they're getting all sorts of business sponsorships for this. And they're very similar to the Nepa State down in Sussex. They are get raising considerable income off the tourism of, of Make It Wild. So yoga retreats, willow fence making projects, woodland walks, meditation, etc. Because that impact on humans is so vitally important. Um, finally, I'm delighted to have Chris talk in an air conditioned, well not air conditioned, but a cool space, a bit about what we've done here and also about the Wildfell Center for Environmental Recovery. Chris. Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, from ground control's perspective, caring for our environment is our, our core purpose. So we're absolutely focused on that and dedicated to, uh, to driving that through. And part of our strategy is to enhance nature wherever we can. And we're, we're very fortunate as a business to be operating in an area where we're delivering landscape management uh, across a number of sectors through our, our GM business, through our utility, our rail, and also creating new landscapes through our, our design and, and consultancy business. And in, in terms of what we're doing as a business, I, I see us delivering in, in three main areas. Uh, the first of those is, is working with our clients. So you know, we're very fortunate to have a, a huge range of, 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 of clients. We're working with Ricky on the um, uh, tiny forests and the, the legacy forests. We're working with uh, Network Rail on their biodiversity projects, uh, national highways with their, with their pollinator partnerships, um, pollinator corridors, sorry. Uh, and also we've just finished a project with Tesco, a, a national tree planting project. So it's, it's great to have that influence and be able to help, help those customers deliver on the ground. Um, we're also, as, as Kim mentioned already, we're investing through our Evergreen Fund. So um, Helen and, and Chris's as Make It Wild was an early investment. We're supporting the Essex Forest Initiative, uh, obviously Essex-based tree planting. We're working with the Cotswolds National landscape uh, and also supporting Highlands Rewilding, two really fantastic projects up in, in, in Scotland. Uh, and the third area is our what I call our own projects. So it started off with Little Cowbridge Wood um, and Little Cowbridge Grange, so 35 acres, uh, a 35 acre site where we're really focusing on green gains. We've got our 22 acres of, of new woodland that we've created, um, but also really looking at all those opportunities for biodiversity, or, or should I say nature recovery, uh, around the site. Um, and also, sort of really excitingly, is our flagship scheme up at Wildfell. So the, the 300 acre site that we launched uh, this time last year, um, which is you know, our, our centre for environmental recovery, and just to give you a quick update on, on where we are with that uh, project now, we're, we're finalising our, our designs for the scheme. So we're looking at 120 acres of, of woodland creation, so new predominantly broadleaf woodland. We've got uh, 100 acres of, of habitat creation, so looking at um, really building on the biodiversity and delivering biodiversity net gain in, in a measurable way. Uh, and also bringing the 55 acres of woodland, existing woodland, back into management. Um, with Chris and Philip and I, we have our we're weekly meetings when we launched the Evergreen Fund, and now they're monthly and occasionally around updates. But for years, we sat on the ground control board talking about revenue, like what are, you know, what are we making, what are we getting paid, how are we growing, and now we talk about, okay, how much are we spending? And it's so exciting. There are even more exciting conversations on what we're investing for nature. We bought a 300-acre farm that, you know, was, wasn't inexpensive to do, but also all the investments that we're making to plant trees for others on other pieces of property, along with what we're doing there, um, and it and it feels great. This is a very diverse panel, and that you have, you know, we are a private commercial company. We're privately held, and with because the values alignment, we can do whatever we decide to do. Um, with Seven Trent Water, there's. A wide range of shareholders and they have different pressures a government agency Helen and Chris so there's a wide range of people but all looking towards the same things when you're designing something from scratch so this is a question for Matt how can you really think about nature in a different way 
we're, we're all trying to reverse engineer, like what can we do to mitigate damage that we're doing? I mean, when you're starting from scratch, what can you do? 23 kilometers of road. This is not an insignificant road. It's three lanes in each way. It's 60 meters wide. It's quite a scar. Um, and so we've stood back and said, okay, so how do we first off minimize carbon? Well, the way you do that on a big road scheme is you, you, you pick the material up, you, you need to move out the way and you keep it on site. So you keep it close. So actually of our road, 80% of it is below ground or behind buns. So what that then is, does from a nature perspective means, A, you can't see the road. We are often criticised actually for not showing true photographs or portrayals of, of the future of the road. The reality is you can't see it. And by the way, when you drive down it, you can't see off it. So it's not, you know, this isn't built for the, the, the drivers. It's <laughs> built for the community around it, built for nature around it. But we have sort of six of these large crossing bridges, um, the largest being uh, 80 metres, which is all about connectivity between existing woodlands. Um, and it's probably the best we can do in, you know, you've got a 60 metre wide road. How do you make sure that inv invertebrates, dorse, uh, dormice, etc., bats all cross it? So we've got, you know, a football pitch wide bridge that horses will be able to ride over without noticing the road below, where you would have trees and you'll have a cycle path and you'll have a small country road going next to you. So we'll have 10,000 people at peak, 22,000 people over the life of the project. And if we can leave a legacy in their minds of actually how important nature is and how nature and construction come together. I've been in construction 30 years. I can tell you it doesn't come together in many people's minds in construction. So if I can leave 22,000 people understanding that no longer is it about cost and time, it's about cost, time and sustainability. And that, that's, the, that's what we're trying to do. Um, ground control, we, we've always said we put people at the center of everything we do care for the environment. It was sort of messy and our new team that's, that's running the business now <coughs> put it together so succinctly, human nature, because it's all about people and planet. And um, when those are working harmoniously, what a difference. Uh, Ricky is going to, my next question specifically for you, so that for everybody that is in business here, what is the return on investment? This does cost money, but what is the return on investment specifically for Sep and Trent on these wonderful initiatives you're doing around the Commonwealth Games? Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good question. And I'll, I'll add another catchphrase is that as Liv alluded to before, what's good for nature is good for water. And at the, the, the head of our supply chain is the water, which we all drink, we all use, um, and it's our core business model um, as we all pay bills. And, and that's our kind of our key um, business approach. Um, for us, we've got to listen to our regulators, um, our shareholders and also looking at what our customers want. Aside from cheap bills, what else do they want us to do as a regulator, as a landowner, as someone who can potentially bring a lot of parties together um, to make sure that we can deliver anything around nature and improvements around there. So for us is that for every one pound we spend on nature, we will have a significant saving back on chemical reduction, water quality issues, leakage reduction, which in turn then leads to a better or a, a easier to get net zero um, and pass those cost savings on to our customers as well. I'm going to answer the question I just asked Ricky for ground control. Um, when we do the right thing around purpose-driven business, so whether that's investment in our people development, mental health initiatives, biodiversity in nature, tree planting, the evergreen farm, whenever we do the things that we love to do they, because they feel good and they feel right, the, um, the, the return on those investments are enormous. And they're enormous in a bunch of things. One is we're able to attract the very best people. We, we punch so far above our weight in attracting world-class talent to join a little landscaping company based in Billericay, Essex. I mean, go figure. So I, and again, everyone that's here today, thank you for joining us on this journey, but it has made all the difference to focus on purpose over, you know, practice. And the second thing is, and is just as important, is our customers. We've only ever won work on price for years and years. I mean, business is running almost 50 years. We won because we were the lowest price provider, including our customers in this TP and online today. We are now increasingly competing for work based on values, not value for money, because our customers care. They care about doing the right thing around how people are treated, health and safety, mental. 
especially how we're treating the planet and how we're interacting with nature and what a sea change and how exciting. So this is like, you know, preaching to the choir. It truly is because everyone here, we're already aligned on this stuff. So how do we get more of this out into the wider world? And it's, it's forming exemplars. So we do our little bit here, what Laura Thames Crossing the Highways Agency, not only on that project, but with the Pollinator Pathways, Severn Trent Water, and many of the other partners in the Environment Agency are really fighting the really good fight. Um, Tony and all the wildlife trust, the government agencies, for everyone just to raise the volume about what they're doing and then do the cross-pollinization. So thank you so much, wonderful panelists. And introduce Matt Noakes, our technical director for, um, for environmental services, and Jack Potter. Jack's recently joined us. And they're going to show and talk to you about how we are thinking of joining up all these different 55,000 sites with a lot of linear infrastructure. And pictures are worth a thousand words. They're going to show you the images on that. Okay? Hey, guys. Thank you. We are super excited to have this slot uh, uh, just, to, just to share with you really what we believe is possible. And, and actually bring that to life through visual aids and, and mapping. And, and we've got the clicker here, and, and we're going to refer to the, the screen quite a bit because actually bringing this to life is so important through visual images. What well, the important message here today is actually we in this room, as businesses and organisations, can lead that change. As, we, as we've heard from the panel and Tony, we, we can make a difference here and, and how we take this forward. So I think there's, there's three takeaways I want to take away from here today. The first one is actually how there's an increased sense of purpose um, of how we can come together and, and contribute to nature recovery, but at scale. At scale is the big part here and actually how we connect there. Also how theoretical modelling can help with give inf informed decision making about what we do on our sites, but also the impact of that beyond the site boundaries. It's super important. And then lastly, as we've been talking about all morning, is how we can come together collectively and work together and be greater than the sum of our parts. In the words of, uh, of Professor Lawton, we, what we need to do needs to be bigger, better, um, and what is the, the, sort of the main, main point of this presentation is it needs to be more joined up. So local authorities will be sort of muddling through this as part of the Environment Acts that, you know, they'll be required to, to sort of generate these local nature recovery strategies. And, and my favourite one is BEETLE. So uh, it does stand for something, but I won't, uh, I won't pronounce it because um, I'll probably forget one of the, one of the, one of the letters. Um, but it's been sort of coined and promoted by the Forestry Commission. And it looks at a really sort of granular and high resolution um, at, at a really local level, but it can be sort of multiplied and scaled up to, to national level. Um, and that sort of looks at species mobility, look at, you know, taking core sites, so our most important wildlife sites for different broad habitat types, and how far a species is likely to travel from that into the wider landscape. So we're here today at Green Gains Live in Essex. Um, so, and, and you've heard lots about what ground control are already doing. So, you know, there's, there's wild fell, there's little Cowbridge wood here. Um, and what, what, a, what, what better a place than to, to sort of emphasise uh, and, and sort of give you an example of how this model might work than, than Essex itself. And we're just going to set the scene of effectively what, what is possible. So Essex is absolutely peppered with internationally and nationally important sites. Um, there's, there's just under 2,000 designated wildlife sites in Essex. Um, and natural green infrastructure covers about 14%. And these sort of fragmented remnants uh, of habitat, we're going to refer to as, as core habitat in this presentation. And, and, and these are the sites that we effectively need to expand and build on to, to allow them to sort of overspill into the wider landscape. A common thread running through a lot of the literature and studies that, are, that have happened in the last couple of decades is that everything needs to be more connected. That's what we need to actually do. Um, and, and that will enable species mobility between sites. It increases genetic gene pools, which, which in, in turn effectively increases the resilience of the landscape. 
So this is, the, this is where the exciting bit comes in, and this is actually where the real journey pins for, for people here in this, in here today. This is uh, all of our sites that we have an influence through customers and clients, 1,500 sites here in Essex, which is phenomenal. And you can see the distribution spread. That's spread across 70 clients. There's a huge footprint to start to build this community and how we can come together for a greater good. But let's, get, let's go further on to that and we start adding on the road networks. And this is the road networks and the, the infrastructure at, at highways level. This isn't looking down at, at local level. We add on the rail networks on, on top of that. And you can see how they're starting to permeate and navigate and, and really transcend through the landscape and connect these habitats. We add on the waterways as well. Absolutely. And then lastly, we, we've got utility, power, and you can really, it, it builds a picture. And I think look, this image is the w image that really brings it, brings it to life. And you can see the scale of the opportunity if we absolutely come together and collaborate and work together to connect, connect habitats. Over 80% of these sites sit within 400 meters of core habitats. So we've taken a sample area of, of, of sort of what we've considered typical Essex countryside now. And, and, and this is effectively just to drill down into, into a local context of, uh, you know, essentially what this sort of modelling technique might look like um, and really bring it to life so people can actually see physically what we're talking about. I'd like to give some kudos to Natural England because they've, they've made an amazing data set freely available um, very recently in April this year, um, and it's called Living England. And Effectively, it identifies the white spaces in between all the habitat sites. So it's all the stuff that, I guess, traditionally conservationists and, and, and ecologists don't really care about. It's, you know, the core areas where the species are that everyone's, you know, getting on their hands and knees for. And as you'll see, the red areas on the, on the image, they illustrate areas with really high resistance to woodland species. So there'll be areas of really dense ur urban area and uh, arable land, for example, cereal crops. And then the green areas are, you know, potentially non-core woodland sites, scrubland, species-rich grassland, which might be easier for a woodland species to travel across. And in this example, we've used a nuthatch, which is a bird native to, to, to Britain, which is widespread across England and Wales, as a sort of flagship species to just illustrate this model. This is the beetle analysis, which is what I spoke to to you about earlier, which is my, my sort of preferred method, which, which effectively buffers those, those core habitats. And as you can see on the map, the, the sort of red areas are isolated core habitats, where theoretically a nuthatch living in one of those core habitats can't sort of disperse further than, than that, that isolated habitat. So they're, they're the isolated pockets. And then we've got the yellow, the blue and the purple clusters of functionally linked core habitat. So they're close enough and the land in between is permeable enough that theoretically species can travel between them. If we overlay, which should be coming up, our, our client sites and our infrastructure routes that's taken from that Essex map, this is, this is really interesting. This is, and so, so, so the, we can dig into the detail now and really actually understand where are those opportunities lie. And actually, for those, I'm going to come close to this screen for those uh, who can see this screen. And actually, I want to pick up three, three observations, really. This, this, this pink dot in the middle here, just above the, the railway line in the, in, in the blue area here, you can see here there's an opportunity potentially with this site that actually it sits between two fragmented core habitats. So there's opportunities there to connect those habitats if there's the potential for land and space to actually put woodland uh, planting in. So that's, that's one example, which is fantastic. Now, the other one is not the red herring, but you've got this li linear infrastructure here running straight through this, this pilot area. And you can see how this, this linear infrastructure could help connect core habitats, but also, as Jack was talking about, it can help connect in these mobility zones, those areas that don't just connect just yet. So you can see the, 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 the different sort of functionally linked clusters of, of uh, core habitats and where they overlap. That means that the gap is too great for a species, given the existing land use up there and the permeability of that, to go from one core habitat to the next. But if you were to implement a core habitat creation scheme, 
in that exact location, then you would bridge the gap between those, those functionally linked habitats. So these are the real sweet spots as to you know, where would be best placed. And unfortunately, we have a point in one of those sweet spots, and that's where we are today. So this is Little Cowbridge, Cowbridge Wood, which, um, as you've heard a little bit about already, and you will all see later, um, where effectively, upon maturity, um, will be a core woodland priority habitat. Um, and, and this has effectively acted as a stepping stone between two functionally linked, um, separate core habitat clusters. So when this is implemented um, in the model, you can see that the, the green area reaches the purple zone and it also reaches the blue zone. So, so those are now, you know, once that's implemented, actually functionally connected. And it's a snapshot example of how one client site can, can, can be more than the sum of its parts, you know, looking beyond its own ownership boundary, tying into the wider landscape and to other client sites as well, to have more of a meaningful difference than just, here's our site, we can do this. It's looking beyond that. We shared with you as a very quick snapshot today of the opportunity at a local level with the client sites, the infrastructure reach, that there's real opportunity to collaborate here. We've also then gone on to show actually how theoretical modeling can help drive decision making on your sites that can actually have a bigger impact and a more connected impact at scale. But then look, it's been mentioned this morning, uh, Kim mentioned it a minute ago, let's look at what that really looks like if we scale that up. And that's just a, a, a picture of overlapping dots, 55,000 sites. And we are talking about Essex, which sits in the very corner of that, that site. And if we scale up the opportunities we've set on that pilot onto the national scale, it, it, it's, it's quite phenomenal. And we have the opportunity in this tent and online and those beyond to really make a difference, come together, take the lead, Let's carry on this conversation today and move it forward. Well done, both of you. That was fascinating. Um, I'm opening it up to questions, oh, including our virtual guests that are joining today. Jill, do you have microphones that you could pass around? So anyone with a question, raise your hand. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, Archie Ruggles, Price of Plains for the State. Um, I feel a little bit out of, uh, slightly out of sector here, but it's very nice to be invited to sit amongst people who, who own and manage far more land than, than I do. I suppose I'm here possibly nominally representing the 17.3 million um, hectares of agricultural land in the, in the country, in the UK, 71% of the land, um, of which the average holding size is 81 hectares. Now, you know, looking at the opportunities that have been mapped out there, you know, variously described as white space or highly impermeable habitats and things like that, there does seem to me a huge opportunity for the people in this room and the people in my sector, perhaps through organisations like the Pharma Cluster that we're pulling together, is, I guess my question really is how do we then bring that together? Because there's a huge amount that needs to be done for my sector to learn from all the people in this room as to how do you make those business decisions and the return on investment that you so clearly outlined for your sector, it's a much harder argument to make in the private small, uh, small landowner sector and the farming sector. So I guess I throw it open to, to the expertise in the room as to how do we solve that problem? How do we take the learning and the expertise that you guys have got and deliver this across 17.3 million hectares. Well, I'm going to pass this to Tony. Thank, thank you, Kim. I'll just say that was amazing, Matt and Jack. That's an incredible piece of work you've done there and is exactly the kind of thing that relates to Archie's question and the extent to which we go beyond that being, you know, your clients, and it's fantastic that you've done that, but to make it something which is the entire landscape, including the people who are not ground control clients. But the fact that you've done that is an amazing start because then it's a way into the community that Archie is in, which is the farming landowning community, producing food, trying to do nature recovery. And if you can blend that group in to what you're doing, then it just goes to another level again. And so this is the opportunity we've got over the coming couple of years 
because in that Environment Act that you put up there earlier on is a new government requirement for every county in England to produce a local nature recovery strategy. So that's the law, it's coming. It's just presently going through secondary kind of refinement of rules and regulations. But that will be the template that we will be able to use in Essex, in Suffolk, in Cambridgeshire, in Northamptonshire. Every county in England is going to have to do one. And there will be two things that will make these things work. So one is information and data and the extent to which we can paint that picture. And what you just showed us is incredible. That's exactly what we need in, in order to be able to say, actually, don't put the woodland there, put it here. Don't restore the grassland there, do it here. We need a string of ponds here. We need to rewild that river valley. And these are the places to put beavers back. All of that can come from that kind of spatial analysis. So that's one piece we need. And actually, there's another government programme underway now, and Natural England very much leading that. It's called the National, uh, National Ecosystem and Natural Capital Assessment, or worse to that effect, isn't it? We, we got a big science team working on that. And so that's going to be refining the kind of data that you've already been using. We're going to go deeper and refining that further. So that information and data piece is critical. But then the next piece is going to be the quality of the interaction between all the different actors who can make a difference. And so the farmers, the companies who've got land next to a retail park, uh, the infrastructure providers, rail, road, water, bringing all of them into a meaningful conversation where they can actually see what they can do based on that data. And so that's where Natural England will be supporting local authorities to try and make that happen. And we've got 40 new colleagues, haven't we, coming on stream soon. Uh, and Jack and Matt, I'm, I'm just thinking maybe, you know, if you could show that presentation to those people who are just about to join us, that would be a fantastic way of, of giving them some energy and see what's possible. Um, because I, I, that, that was really brilliant. So that's the answer, I think, Archie, is those local nature recovery strategies and then engaging people in that. And so in your community, um, county level NFU, CLA, you know, that's a way of galvanising those members, um, one would expect. Um, and, you know, the farmer clusters that are popping up in different places and another way in. And local, uh, the, the, the local nature partnerships, Simon is here, Simon Lister from the Essex um, Nature Partnership. You know, that there are institutions at county level. Um, it's a, a happy coincidence that the wildlife trusts are organised at county level as well. So there's various kind of layers of, of um, you know, partnership building that could occur uh, once we can see that picture laid out so clearly like that. I'm Deb Davies-Tutt. I work and own Ashwell's Reclaimed Timber, which in essence we reuse the rainforest material that's already in this country to try and reduce any more coming in. Um, we also own a site, so I suppose I'm bringing the conversation to a more layman type question. Our site backs onto some fenlands, so what practically could we do to try and introduce all the wonderful things you've been talking about today? John, I don't know if you know anything about that part of the county and can give any reflections on what might be the, the thing to do there. So basically this is about how you might interact with people who own land next to you, is it? Yeah. For very kind of you know, local knowledge like that, you know, it's often um, you know, sort of natural England representatives, wildlife trust representatives, you know, or, or some of the local naturalists. There's always a lot of, a lot of yeah. um, ideas and thinking out there about what might work and, and looking at other good examples. And I just also wanted to make a plug for the, the local nature party. As I said, we've only been going four months. We're one of the newest local nature parks in the country. But what we want to do is continue the conversation that has started mm. in this tent because it is a partnership. And so it is a mix of business, of farmers, of statutory agencies, of the NGOs, uh, all those, and communities. I mean, there is some terrific community work going on in Essex, but we need, we need more of it. We're going to wrap up with just some things. If you have taken things away on how you can use your property in a positive way for nature to connect networks for nature conservation, if you've taken away what you can do to help cross-pollinate and share this information, share more loudly what you're doing, turn the volume up, just please do it. If you heard somebody say something and you want to learn more, reach out. Just get the conversation going and keep it going. And I just think, you know, change for the future for our own well-being, if you don't care about it, for your own well-being, there is such a direct, 
direct and, and vitally important link. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Warm, warm applause for everybody. Thanks.